much I want to go through with you. Um, a lot's been written about your sound, your signature style, and I wonder if, if you feel that you're more of a chameleon, or do you have a, do you have a style? It's not my ambition to have a style. To the extent that I have a style, it's a result of a failure. Yeah, you know? How's that? Um, well, I mean, I kind of think that each song and ideally each moment, each situation should be approached anew. You know, I mean, I didn't play, for example, on those Waits tunes because I thought this is the way you should play guitar. I, I played in that way because that character on guitar made sense with the lyrics and the other instruments, you know, and on a different tune, a completely different sound, a completely different approach, you know. I mean, I, I believe in literacy, you know. If you're going to call yourself a guitarist and, like, have the nerve to think that the world should pay your rent just because you play six strings, <laughs> then I think it behooves you to know, like, what other guitarists have done, you know. <laughs> Right? Yeah. You know, I mean, if, if you're, uh, you know, if you're a carpenter, you have to know all the different, you have to have all the different sizes of screwdrivers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we talked about this uh, actually on the way to the interview, just uh, your different collaborations and, you know, you get asked to collaborate with a lot of people and you enjoy going into the into the recording studio and doing different projects. Is there, is there, is there a test like, or what, what, did, what would attract you to doing a recording with someone? First, I look at the purse. You look at the purse. <laughs> no, I mean, um, well, that, that's, totally that's legitimate. there, yeah, you know, of course, that's there. Of course, yeah. You know, Papa's got a, Papa needs a new pair of shoes and all that. I really like the craft of recording. I mean, as long as the situation is, and all you uh, record moguls out there and in, in, uh, in the blogosphere, uh, take note, you know. Uh, Noise Incorporated, that's me, markrebo.com. Um, I never go, I never check it, but my manager does. But <laughs> uh, no, I love recording. I love the craft of recording. I love the process. Um, you know, if the producer's cool, it's almost, I always, almost always enjoy it and learn something from it. And uh, it's a chance for me to ch try out my zillions of guitars, you know, like take them out for a test drive, see how they sound with different mics. It's fantastic. Um, so, yeah, I like the recording part of it very much. Well, Tom Waits, obviously, you, it's probably the artist that gets most associated with you, or it's always brought up, like, how, how is it to work with Tom Waits? He's a, he's a really, he's had an interesting career, and I wonder what it's like to go into the recording studio or on tour with, with, with Waits. Does he, does he let, does he let his musicians do their own thing? Is he, does he direct you heavily? Well, what people hear when they hear a record, they hear the results of the record. But what musicians experience when they make a record, you know, yeah, they interact with the artist, but they interact a lot with the producer because the producer is the one who says okay or not okay, oftentimes. And so people know Waits as an artist, but we met Waits, you know, me and the people who were in the bands I was in with, met Waits as a producer. Yeah. And Tom is a very ingenious and original producer. And not because he's a big technical expert who knows every microphone and every compressor, but because he's really bloody minded in getting what he wants. You know, if it's not sounding like he wants, believe me, he will stay on it until it does. Um, and that's something I hugely respect. In fact, I kind of respect bloody mindedness in general. <laughs> you know, people who just say, I'm going to get this done, you know. Um, and as, as a band leader, the way Tom 
you know, I, I've been very lucky, I have to say, generally working with people who are very respectful of the musicians. And, and um, Tom is, as a band leader, the way, the way he works creatively is he doesn't come in with a written part. He doesn't tell you what to do. He creates, a, you know, he'll play um, and you listen to what, or I listen to the, the lyrics of the tune what the tune is trying to say, uh, what it's trying to say dramatically. Who is, who is this character that's singing? You know, because Tom can be a lot of, and we all can be a lot of different people. You know, some of us choose to only be one, but, you know, uh, we can all, um, we can all, we all contain multitudes. Mm -hmm. And, um, and so, you know, try to sort out what is the scene that's being set and where is, what kind of guitar is in that scene, what makes sense. And so, Waits functions as a kind of an editor. You know, if something's working, you just play. If it's not working, he'll ask you to change. And so you change, you know, try something different. But he does, you know, within those parameters, there's a lot, I found a lot of freedom in the band. And the other side of it is, you know, it's not just a question of, of can you do what you want or can you not do what you want. The other side of, of Waits' music that I, that I dig is he has a lot of groove. And, like, people, I think the groove thing is misunderstood in a way. People often mistake it for metronomic accuracy. It's not. Some people have great groove and shitty time. Tom, Tom's sense of time is, is fine, okay? But what I mean by groove is that it matters to him a lot if it gets the feel mm. that he wants. Yeah. In other words, it's, it matters to him a lot. He cares deeply. And if it's not working right, he's not happy, you know? So... It feels like there's so a that lot kinda, of elements. It's very yeah. orchestral and... Yeah, but rhythmically. Yeah. I'm talking about rhythmically. He has... He's experienced music that rocks deep. And he wants that. And so you can have all the freedom in the world. You know, you, or freedom or not freedom, whatever. Like, the idea that a band leader wants something and they want it bad that energizes the band. Right. You know, hopefully you can... So, and he was able to communicate it with it. Yeah, you yeah. to you. Oh, yeah, it was communicated, yeah. you know, on, <laughs> on, stage and, on stage and off. But he, like I say, always with, with Tom in a, in, a, in a cool way, you know. He, he, is much, he was always much harder on himself. You know, he, he's very... He's a, he's a demanding... Uh, artist I would say well I'm not I'm not a musician but I did do a fine arts degree my major was in dance ah really and I was always attracted to Tom Waits music I think rhythmically it's really interesting yeah. I think I, I it hits me almost viscerally and you, I don't know there's it does something to your body yeah if you just let your body react to it well he's you know he's channeling something he's channeling something pretty deep ab about um, um some some deep currents of american music i would say of black american music in particular mm -hmm. uh, but also of irish song and l there's a lot in there just just before the pandemic hit you had a recording project and a concert right here on this stage with a local band haram led oh. by gord gradina and yeah yeah we have we have the Oh, Advanced this is copy, where the, which I'm just going to bring this up because it's coming out next yes. month. It's a fa that was a fantastic gig, and Gordon and the band are great. Um, and I was, I was very, you know, I didn't know what it was going to be before came. I came and I thought, uh oh, 
what's it going to be? But it turned out great. Um, yeah, you, I think you fit in like uh, what I liked. I mean, you were a featured guest artist for the project, and but you fit in with with the ten guys and just as if as if you were just one of the guys and had been playing with them since since the inception. Obviously, super for, for Gord to get to work with you. He uh, he opened for you here on this stage when you came with Ceramic Dog a few years earlier. Oh, okay. And I remember thinking, okay, so this was for my jazz audience, and yeah, I know you like to play loud, Mark. And we should maybe you start you start your your book with how you like yeah. to play loud. <laughs> and I'm like, will my how will my jazz audience react to Ceramic Dog? And uh, oh. it was one of our loudest shows, but you know, you brought your audience here. People were here. They loved the show. Uh, Gord opened as a duo and uh, maybe set this course in motion of eventually being able to collaborate together. So I, I love seeing these things evolve. So that's just my little, and you know, you've, you've got such a vast world. This is just one little corner, but um, it meant a lot to us to have you come. You know, you must know you have fans all over the world. Well, that's always good to hear. But um, yeah, no, I'd, I, I think Gordon and the band are great. And I was very happy to do that and very happy to see it coming out. And um, I do want to, I want to mention another collaboration, your duo with David Hidalgo from Los oh. Lobos, which I just love. What a charming <laughs> rep, rapport you guys have. And it's a, well, first of all, it's wonderful. Hidalgo is just a genius. He's a great guitarist, um, producer, songwriter. I mean, trace player, accordion player. Plays everything. Cellist. Yeah, know. anything with I strings. Mean, yeah. Singer, you know. Beautiful um, voice, yeah. Yeah, no, Hidalgo's great. And so that, and also what I love of, about Los Lobos is like the total, the total honesty of the band, you mm -hmm. know. Like they're, they've been together a zillion years and they stand up there and they just rock the house and that's what they do. They're not pretending to be anything they're not. You Probably know. 30, at least 30 year history yeah, or yeah. more. No, I, I love, and, and they don't, it's like they're not saying, okay, we're going to be Mexican and we're going to play into a myth of what that is. They're going to, you know, they're happy to be dudes who grew up in, in East LA listening to Jimi Hendrix, yeah. you know? And they bring all those influences yeah, into Yeah, or the it, Grateful yeah. Dead. Yeah, yeah. Um, they, they do some You know, covers. in other words, they're not, they're not building some kind of, myth about themselves they're they're just playing the music that rocks the house mm -hmm. that's what that's what i believe in well we we filled up the theater for you guys it was packed and uh and as you know robert plant and his whole band showed up to hear oh, you guys yeah. play you know i know you, you have you have history with with robert plant and alice yeah. Krauss, that mm -hmm. wonderful record raising sand and then they just released a new record and, yes they did and you and david are on the new record right Right. Was your part in the new record? Was it was it from the past well, recording? Well, it was from both. It's from both. Um, okay. I mean, what happened was I, I don't know if I'm supposed to talk about this, but no one told me not to. So what happened was after the first record was such a huge hit, we all got together again in Nashville and started recording a second one. Ah. Okay. Um, and man, I just remember it was like we were going like they had two or three studios going with different things, overdubs, mixes, rough mixes, bounces, everything. It was like huge production with a lot of people and it just kind of got out of hand. Sometimes that happens, you know. Sometimes you have too many choices, too many tracks, too many. There wasn't real clarity on, you know, there was some things that weren't clear and it was, and the playing was, and, and the, the tunes were stellar, mm -hmm. you know, and the musicians, it just the level of musicianship, T-Bone, T-Bone Burnett was producing. Burnett, producer, yep. And who you've worked with yeah, yeah, quite, and a, the, quite a bit. And the people who he brings in are just amazing, you know, and of course, Robert and Allison, you know, you know, what can you say? There's, there's, a, there's a very, you know. Who knew it was going to work, though? Like, it's an unusual Yeah, it was pairing. a very unusual Exactly. It's not what you would expect, but, but um, 
you know, there's, there, I've worked with a lot of singers, but there, I remember recording uh, uh, one, one of the songs with Alison Krauss where I was so into listening to what she was singing, so moved by it, that I forgot to play. Oh, wow. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah. <laughs> Not the whole tube, but for long enough. It's one I was of the, like. <laughs> it's magical stuff, yeah. It, yeah. Just, it just worked. And, you know, what can you say? Robert Plant, you're talking to a guy who, when he was like, I told you my junior high school band was Love Gun, <laughs> which we thought he wrote. <laughs> well, he made a big impression on us. He came yeah. in, was super friendly and down to earth. And, yeah, yeah. You know, he, of course, you know, I, I try not to be starstruck, but certainly I was with Someone you listened to since you were a teenager, Led Zeppelin, are just massive, and that's yeah. No, it's amazing when you me, meet yeah. people like that. I get starstruck sometimes too. Yeah. But you know, uh, Robert, he's you know like, what's cool about what I've met. I mean, I've had good luck, maybe, but I, I also think that a lot of the English rockers come from you know actually come from a from a background where they, where they are, where a lot of them did, are working class kids, you know. Like the Beatles. Uh, yeah, well, yeah. like the Beatles. Um, and, or like I think Plant, he, he was uh, very cool with the musicians and down to earth and um, yeah. Like a lot of the English uh, player, rockers of his generation is like, serious record archivist you yeah. know so him and t-bone were getting into some pretty nerdy um uh discussions on uh, on on 50s blues and 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 r b sessions you know i bet elvis costello is yeah is, is in elvis that same too. vein right definitely yeah another one of your collaborators yeah um i guess i had one one question that i did want to ask you is You've worked with a lot of people. Is there anyone on your wish list, living or dead, that you wish you could collaborate with oh. that you haven't? God, I don't know. That's a difficult question. I have to think about that. Okay. <laughs> um, I mean, James Brown isn't with us anymore. Um, Tiny Tim. Tiny Tim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. What, what do you see as, as the future for, for artists? Do you think it's it, that we're going back to normal times, or is there really is a new normal coming up? Uh, well, look. Okay, here I'm going to put on my political hat. Yeah. Um, I think that indie artists... I, th I think that there's a lot of changes that are like that are happening and that are likely to happen um, and they're unpredictable but what's certain is this is that what I've seen what I've seen in the pandemic is that the groups that have representation the groups that are organized and have political voice get taken care of the club owners got organized, this thing called uh, uh, National Independent Venues Association in the United States. I'm sure there's a Canadian equivalent. They got $15 billion in shuttered venue operator grants. Yep. Okay, $15 billion. Wow. Okay. The nonprofits got organized. You know, the, the National Endowment for the Arts got well-funded, and it's Canadian equivalents. Independent musicians, people who record for indie labels um, are not in the United States really represented by the American Federation of Musicians. Um, and well, we need to be represented by somebody because to not be represented, you can die from that. Yeah. That became really clear to me during, during the pandemic. We had no voice in government. We had no voice anywhere. You know, like, it was just like people said, we didn't fit into any of the categ pre-figured categories right. that were made, you know, 
Um, are you an employer? Are you an employee? Well, we're, you know what I mean? We, we didn't fit the existing categories, and so they, we were invisible. And that's really dangerous. It's really dangerous. So what I see as the future is that um, musicians, in, independent indie musicians, we need to, uh, I mean, it's a, it sounds trite to say, but we need to get together. We need to, if musicians can organize and put in, put in the work to do that, then we can deal with whatever, we can find some kind of way to get through what's coming. It's a big job to advocate. Yeah. And to, and to get, come together first of all, and then. Well. But you're fighting the good fight, Mark. That's, that's, that's awesome. You, you know, I, I feel like you've been an uncompromising artist for your, for your whole career. Yeah, Great respect for you. Thanks. Good luck with, with the book. Now, now that you're a published author, <laughs> <laughs> you can add that to your resume. Yeah. That's, that's fantastic. I hope there's more to come. I really. So does my publisher. <laughs> Keep the stories coming. Keep the rants coming. And uh, all the best uh, with with the next tour and what's next to come. Thank you so much for taking the time today to, to be with us. Thank you. Thank you.